Okay, so this is the entrance here at Hand Drawn Pressing in Addison, Texas. When we come in here, we're actually in the warehouse. We're in the stored goods area. This is where they store all of the jackets and labels and stickers and all of the product that's needed to put that record together after it's pressed. So we're gonna find out about what they do here and we're gonna be heading into the offices and get an interview with the creator. Come on with me. Hello everybody, we're here at Hand Drawn Pressing in Addison, Texas, which is just outside of the Dallas area. And I'm here to welcome the uh, creative officer right you're the chief yeah. creative officer hey, hey, hey the go. cco yeah yeah and his name is dustin blocker how are you dustin hey good thanks good. for hosting us today sure it um it's really interesting to have a plant right here in the metroplex uh and you guys uh really do a lot with a relatively small space it's really amazing to me and i really what impresses me is you have a really nice flow the way things go in the in the factory and uh you know to me it's one that represents what uh vinyl is all about and it's about people who really care because it takes a certain passion to do this uh so why don't you tell us how you got started yeah that's exactly right um well thank you yeah, you're welcome first off Thanks. yeah the uh we spent a lot of time and energy trying to uh make sure the place is clean and, and is. everything flows in a certain way and that's exactly it. It's um, it's always going to be about the people. Um, you know, there's there's automation that happens in manufacturing, of course, sure. and there's some of that going on the machine. But really, besides some of the automation, the machine, every literally every other part of the process is um, is is from people. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the way it started. So I was a singer in a rock band for 17 years. Wow. Uh, then I started a record label, which is Hand Drawn Records, in 2011, uh, and then my business partner and I in 2014. Uh, founded this the manufacturing side for hand drawn pressing cool what was the driver for doing the pressing plant yeah so um so kind of like us you know struggling musician right on the road <laughs> trying to figure it out for decades basically um and seeing how it all worked and then started the label what, what's that really look like the next evolution of music and as we got into it deeper and deeper it was what you know what can we offer that other you know that that can't be offered by other parties that are out there and, and one thing uh, of course, uh, uh, vinyl records are very difficult to manufacture. Yep. Um, I had my, my last record I made for, with my band was actually in the, the vinyl record format. And so when my now business partner asked me, hey, you're in the music business. I said, yeah. He says, is there any money in it? I was like, eh, not really, but there's going to be in vinyl records. And the reason I thought that is I went out to make my record for my own band mm -hmm. um, and just found it was really hard to make. Really, really hard to understand what was the pricing uh, what, what in the world is a lacquer? What is what is a two-step plate? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and then, of course, all the options with colors and packaging. And it was all novel to me because at that point, it was all CDs. And, Absolutely, And yeah. some digital downloads a little bit. Um, so, yeah, I was just really saw there's a big need in the market. And um, my, my, my business partner, uh, Alex, he has a, a long-standing history in manufacturing. And he came from Planet Plastics Manufacturing. His father did it for decades and decades. Uh, so he kind of had a grasp on it, and that's why I stay on the creative side. Yeah. So he can stay on the know how to make it side. Got it. <laughs> and that's where we live. That's that's a great story. Yeah, the 2014. Yeah, that uh, that was really an, a time when there was this implied resurgence, but their supply and demand was really out of whack still a bit. Yep. I think, and uh, yeah, I think you came in at the right time to get things well settled, so that when it really started to hit, you know, you were had hit the ground running already. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, you have what, about 30 employees now approximately? Yep, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So, so you've grown obviously from your early beginnings. You have some automation, which is really cool out there as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we started off, it was a four to five man operation, my partner and I, and we actually have another business partner as well. We were on the floor every day working the presses, pressing the records ourselves, QCing the records ourselves. And that was years um, sure. of the process. And then, uh, you know, co we, we, we were growing our staff. We were growing every year, year over year, about 30% or so, but still relatively small. COVID hit, demand went through the roof, um, if everybody's not aware. So the everybody kind of calls it the COVID albums. So all the artists went away for a while. Uh, when they're in their bedrooms, they're starting to write, create more, more albums come out. Um, that, and then everybody wanted to start growing their collection when they're at home. So really cataloging grew exponentially. 
uh, the number of uh, albums grew exponentially. Uh, so for 27 months, we ran 24 hours a day. Um, and that's when we really grew our staff, grew more production lines, had to put in automation just to keep up. Um, and now we're back at a healthy clip. We run 12 hours a day, okay. um, which is nice. So we run a shift and a half, two shifts uh, of production and then another shift of packing. Gotcha. But for like, 27 months, it was 24 hours of production and then two full shifts of packing. And it was, it was wild for sure. Wow. Yeah. That's, and that's during the time of COVID to, to boot, which is, uh, yeah. some, some, uh, places were like, are you an essential business? Are you not an essential business? Yeah. Yeah. So we were, we were able to run during the, the COVID time period. And then also that 24 hour period didn't end until about June this year. We weren't caught up until June of this year, 23. Wow. Um, and yeah, it was, it's just been a, a wild ride. But yeah, you stated earlier, it's exactly right, is uh, we got to be well set on how to make the disc really well, um, get our name out there in a meaningful way, have customers that trusted us. Um, so then when it all blew up in a good way, um, we were kind of able to handle that volume and grow our team and, and already have what we're about, why we do what we do, uh, and just kind of build that into the culture here. Sure. Now, initially, I know it's partly based on where you started uh, with the band and all. You were really working a lot with smaller artists to get them the vinyl opportunity that they maybe weren't able to get otherwise, differentiate themselves, uh, you know, to their listeners, right? Uh, but then you started to grow to where you had bigger companies coming at you. Because, uh, I mean, some of the, I thought you guys pressed really much lower lots, like a thousand or less, but... You right. do a lot more than that at times, depending on who it is. How did that all, was that all part of the COVID burst? Yeah, exactly right. So it's interesting. We, 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 we kind of built everything um, off of exactly what you said. Smaller artists, touring artists. Most of it was Texas and Nashville based because okay. uh, Nashville's an hour and a half flight sure. from here. So right. a lot of the management groups, um, some, you know, every once in a while kind of a pop of a a semi-major label artist or something would come in. Yeah. Uh, but during that COVID time period, yeah, the the majors and even um, just really large management groups that have multiple artists that are, are very large, uh, we, we're just looking for places that they could get the records done under nine months, 10 months. Yeah. Um, and so then we also already had a kind of a base of, of uh, really good labels that we were working with. So what we did when we saw the kind of the surge of business coming um, we said, here's these few people we really like to work with. And hey, we can give you this many units per month, regardless of what else happens, right? Um, and so we, we just kind of locked that in with some of the folks. So it was easy to work with them. We had been doing projects for years. Sure. Uh, so their volumes grew. So let's just say a, a label out of Nashville that maybe we're doing 1,000, 2,000 unit runs. During those couple of years, those jumped up to 5,000, 10,000, gotcha. 20,000. Um, and that actually has led to kind of the demand curve has changed a little bit in the last six months or so mm -hmm. because everybody overstocked. Oh, yeah. So now there's this leveling out space. But um, no, it was never in the plan to like, hey, let's go after, you know, majors or whatever. Right. It was um, it was kind of opportunity based. Um, but also what we what we did know is we could service all the small artists, 500 unit, 300 unit, 1000 unit. Uh, if we could have a stable 20,000 unit run, running for X amount of hours, fit all these other smaller ones in, it allowed us to grow the company in a meaningful way. And that way, when those, and it always happens, by the way, the majors come in, the majors go out. It's like the ocean coming in and yeah. coming out. Um, so you have to be able to not build your business on them, but be able to handle it if they come knocking. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of what we did. We kind of allowed ourselves to grow and say, okay, let's be smart about it, not overgrow. Uh, so that when they disappeared, which is they're always going to recede a little bit, if not all the way, um, still be able to have a, a healthy business sure. and service all the, the same guys we've been working with forever. That's kind gotcha. of where we are now. Gotcha. Now, I know, you know, there's always the uh, you got to have all the materials to put the record together to get it out the door down to the sticker. Right. As, as we saw some waiting on stickers. But uh, what's your general like lead time uh, in what range are you quoting right now? Yeah, so we're at, we're at a, a standard eight to twelve weeks, okay. um, which is nice. The big hurdle, um, even during COVID time period, it was really on the plating, and then also on the print guys. So there's there's yeah, a bottleneck. Just, exactly. So if everybody's aware, there's 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 a whole supply chain that is that 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 we have to have all our stuff in the advance. Like you just said, stickers is one of them. 
that comes from a different kind of specialty printer than the jackets or inserts or sleeves. Sure. Also, um, the cutting is, a, is typically a whole other set of companies that do those versus plating, which are those stampers that right. you guys saw on the floor. Yep. So, you know, it, without having partners that can handle different volumes from all the different plants, et cetera, their lead times are going to grow. Right. And also, if there's any kind of issue with the print or any kind of issue, moreover, with the audio, now we have to start back over. Sure. And now, now if it took six weeks to get something that used to cost, take two weeks, now it's 12 weeks because it goes back and starts back over. Sure. So that all led to really long lead times. Um, all that said, now it's nice. Um, you know, orders placed. I mean, we're realistically, we've had some go out the door in six weeks. Just how fast can they get us the stuff? How fast can the artists get us, um, you know, center label art, jacket art, and audio um, that we don't have to go back and forth a lot on? Uh, and so it's really an education piece to the small artists to go like, hey, when you're ready to come, like, here's all the facts that of the things that you need are on our website. Uh, when you come more prepared, it makes it really smooth on our, our side. Yeah. And fast. Sure. Now, uh, obviously, you're getting in, you know, stampers. So those have already gone through the whole mastering process and the lacquer. And so, so you're getting it right ready to press course if there's any issues with that at that time we were talking uh, before about you know something that's mastered to vinyl mm -hmm. so that it will work well with vinyl but not if they mastered for a cd for example as we talked uh then it's probably not going to have good results on the vinyl side what kind of uh, mediation has to be done when you run into that yeah that's a great question so on the education side to the artist typically the audio is usually the, the easiest part of this because it's coming from a professional in the studio, usually. So anybody that's kind of serious enough that they're going to put, you know, a check out there that it's, it's expensive to make a record, right? Mm -hmm. vinyl sure. Versus just I put it on Spotify and it's out in the world, oh, yeah. right? Or Bandcamp or whatever. Um, so if they're serious enough about it, typically they've gone through professional services to make their record or make their audio. So usually the education side has not as been as bad because you're talking about a professional audio engineer working with a cutting engineer and give them everything they need. It's really the hardship comes on the print side because it's like, Oh, I can do it cheap and quick. And I, my cousin used to do Adobe illustrator and, you know, and, and then the, it just goes back and forth. And go, that's really the print side is it's kind of mind blowing how much time our, our project managers spend on the print side usually. Really? Um, but you're exactly right. The education does happen. I mean, we're a couple calls a week. Typically, we're talking to recording engineers or mastering engineers, and they say, hey, you know, how do we need to deliver this to the cutting people? Right. Um, it's pretty easy. Uh, you just say, hey, you know, you want it to be, it's going to be a flat cut, meaning typically a cutting engineer doesn't want to have to change anything about the audio itself. They don't want to be liable for it. Um, so they're going to cut it how they receive it. it. Sure. Um, and so you just want to make sure that they're not cutting off the frequency in the top and the bottom because there's there's typically larger frequency range on vinyl. Um, sure. So you get more high end, more low end. Uh, so the less compression they do, which is CDs, they compress <laughs> like yeah. crazy. Right. Uh, don't do compression. If at all, just do very light compression and deliver that to the cutting engineer and it usually works out well. Should flow. Yeah. As long as, uh, last caveat just for the viewers. Yeah. They don't already know. About 22 minutes per side. There you go. Um, that you're going to be in a good spot. Anything over that, you're kind of pushing the limits of of how much is possible per side. Like a wizard of true star by Todd Rundgren. 29 minutes on each side. Woo! Yep. That's and the volume's down on it, obviously, because of yeah. So I mean, it has been done and it has been played with, but uh, the results will vary. I guess, yeah, the and and the artists get it and they go, "Hey, this is quieter than whatever," yeah. you know. And you go, "That's not how it works," you know. I think. Well, I think Todd Rundgren is always pressing. He's always pressing the yeah, the uh, limits. Yeah, yeah he yeah. does. So it's, I think it was quite intentional. Actually. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And back then, that's what all he had was vinyl. That's right. True. So you know that was the case back yeah. then. So that's great. So um, what do you think are the biggest challenges right now in the business uh, as you see it going forward? Yeah, so the biggest one right now, there's going to be a leveling off period. It's already started. Mm -hmm. um, so the demand, uh, so it's always been uh, uh, supply and demand. So there's always been, um, you know, more demand than supply. And now that's flipped. Uh, so there's going to be two, there's, there's right around 200 plants right now on the planet. Uh, when we started this business and we had our prices laying in 2017, there was in the third about 35 plants. That's amazing. Right. It? So 
So just do the math there. And then on top of that, not just number of plants, the number of record presses in the world. So all the very large pressing plants have doubled, some tripled their capacity. Uh, so, you know, you have five plants that are doing more volume than the whole planet did just a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and so they're not running their lines at 100%. Sure. They're down at like 40% some 60 yeah. allegedly so i mean they say yeah. 60 i think they're 30 sure. you know yeah. <laughs> um so they're not running near as much as they did so if i was running 24 hours and i'm running 12 you know that's the same math holds true for them so there's too many plants really is what's happened too many presses out there um in the short term so there's going to be a leveling off where uh, we're going to see what happens hopefully a lot of folks don't go out of business there's been a few already it's already started um equipment for sale all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but then uniquely enough uh, the Vinyl Record Manufacturers Association, uh, which I started with some other plants a few years ago, there's still some new players trying to come into the market, haven't even opened yet. And um, it's just going to be tough if they don't have a book of business already. Um, so I kind of worry for those guys. Um, and of course, I worry for our own plant, like, hey, we got to be able to keep the lights on and stay healthy too. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's just going to be who can be smart, you know, keep it tight, don't try to overextend yourselves and do the right things. Hopefully, I mean, how, how we did it was, you know, if you do the right things, good things happen. It's kind of like, uh, what's the uh, saying? If you never lie, you don't have to remember anything. Exactly. Same kind right. of vibe. Yeah. Um, so that makes it pretty easy. So hopefully that's what, you know, there's more in the world of that. That's what gotcha. my hope is. Yeah. So what's the, uh, the vinyl manufacturers group? What's kind of the mission of that group? Yeah. So it's really collaboration. So we have four pillars. The biggest one is, is collaboration. Uh, collaboration just means that we share information. So in the room, uh, we had our, our we had our member we have two members meetings every year, um, and we had our last one last week in Nashville, um, and we had some really big players like those the massive plants I talked about mm -hmm. during the association, along with the guys that haven't started, along with the medium size and the small mom and pop, and um, but we're all sharing information, mm -hmm. saying here's what we think stats are, here's where the holes are in how many units were made, is that real? Here's here's how we aggregate data. So there's a big piece of that with collaboration. The second piece of that is standardizing. Um, so really, because the market went away for decades and now it's come back, um, there's there's been a real lack of standardization. And by standardization, I mean, like how how big is the box on the pallet? How big should it be? Mm -hmm. What's the thickness of gauge? How many units need to go in each one? What's the variance of, of a single LP versus double LP? Um, how high do you stack them? Um, so some of that can come from the distribution houses and say, here's what we want specifically. Mm -hmm. How big is a pallet and how many boxes sure. go on it? Um, but there's a real way to standardize that too. Uh, and what kind of tape do you use on your deal? Also, uh, uh, what, is, what does QC look like? So us as an association, we put out uh, quality control manuals where we pulled uh, folks in from all the different parts of the industry and said, what are we all looking at when we're looking at a disc, right? What are our people physically looking at? Sure. What are they yeah. listening for? Um, and how do we standardize that? So that was a big part of standardization. Uh, and then uh, again, like kind of the warehousing stuff. And then bringing in a vendor communities that didn't exist, um, at least when we started, like ERP systems, which sounds kind of silly, but it's just like, how do you put the stuff on the shelf in the warehouse? Mm -hmm. and how do you know where it is? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sounds really Inventory simple. Inventory management. Absolutely. Because uh, a lot of these plants start up and they're like, we're going to press records. Yeah. We did it. Now what? Now what? Yeah. There's QC. There's the packing. There's the sh the shipping. The receiving. There's how do you track all this stuff? How do you talk to customers? Um, so we're just really working on that. So collaboration, standardization, and then the other ones are really tied around education and then uh, advocacy, and that really lives in sustainability world. So that's kind of like a hot word everybody uses. But um, we've been to uh, Washington D.C. a couple times this last year, and there's a there's actually a vinyl sustainability council. That's run in Washington by um, by you know Washington. They got they have to Congress comes in and they all talk to each other and say what's coming down the pipe. What kind of um, things are going to affect the plastics manufacturers across the across the U.S. And it's not vinyl records, right? It's the PVC is in the ground in the pipes. It's the wrapping of the wires. It's the stuff that goes on your roof uh, and it's flooring as well. Uh, and then we get to be the cool guys because we make records with PVC. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, li literally, that's what they're saying. Like, they're talking about pipes. We're like, oh, nerds. No, we don't say that. <laughs> but we're like, oh, we're talking about records. We're like, oh, that's cool. Can we use records to talk to the Congress people about why records or why vinyl, sorry, why vinyl needs to be talked about more? And it's it's the most sustainable of plastics. So I'll just kind of leave it on, on the sustainability side. Yeah. Everybody gets worried about plastic. And, and yes, records are made of plastic. 
the hangup is that big ocean of plastic floating out there that everybody thinks about, there's no records floating in it. It's single use plastic, right? It's not mm -hmm. durable plastics. Sure. So the big, the big segregation point is you have single use. I have a fork. I have the thing the Disposable. fork is wrapped in, right? And that's happening all over the place. We all see it all the time. And then you have what's called durable, mm -hmm. and PVC is durable. Secondarily, I, I missed uh, the medical grade is almost all PVC. So the blood bags, that whole blood, cannot be stored in anything else than PVC. They've tried. I'm not a blood bag guy. I don't know yeah. all the math or whatever, but or the <laughs> science behind it. But if you put blood in any other kind of plastic, it doesn't work out too well. Gotcha. So anyways, it's a, it's a big thing um, that I've been learning a lot about. Sure. And uh, so the association is kind of, kind of trying to work with, with the, the big association in, in Washington to kind of see how we fit in sure. and what we can do. Yeah, we saw some great examples of uh, recycling in your own facility yep. uh, of, of records and uh, even the cutaway from the, the record itself on the exactly. edge. So, yeah, I mean, it's very uh, intrinsically, it's, it's got more capability to be sustainable than a lot of other things do. Exactly right. Uh, my mom used to throw records at me occasionally. But, uh, <laughs> That was a whole different thing. That that's, was, right. that's right. She, I think she invented the Frisbee, actually, uh -huh. <laughs> out of a record. That's right. And that's what, hey, if this whole thing crashes, well, let's make some Frisbees and bend the end, we're good to go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, obviously, trends are, you know, demand and supply and that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, what about technologies? I know we're starting to read about these, quote, plastic-injected methodologies what uh, yeah is, is anybody in that field uh, in your group talking about that yeah so there's there's two um injection molding uh in the world and and one of them is here in the states and they're kind of in this they've been in this startup phase is the best way to say it i guess um for six seven years at this point they're still on kickstarter yeah they're in kickstarter <laughs> mode and, uh, and then what's interesting about that though is warner actually tied with a huge manufacturer or was a cd manufacturer which is injection molding yes um with polycarbonate instead of vinyl over overseas and they have actually launched and they this is how it all works we all know it somebody could throw some money at it and boom a machine could be made like that sure so you have your kickstarter and they're like they've been working for years trying to make it and then you had these guys that just came in and said warner uh, we should do this together. And they said, oh, yeah, sure, boom. And within eight months, they had this crazy machine um, that I don't, I've never personally seen one, um, but I know they're in the market. And I was actually on a Reddit thing just earlier today. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about, hey, I have one. And, and I went through the thread and looked about it. It's not PVC, though. No, um, no. I believe it's PLA. Um, and the reason PVC cannot be injection molded, it gets too hot. And so chlorine gas comes out and then everybody dies. So yeah. PVC polyvinyl chloride. Yes. Chloride. Psh, ah, I die. Yeah, right. So let's not do that. No. No, it's, yeah. So it's just, it, it'll be interesting to see if that can get any feet, I guess, so to speak. And why, what's the advantage, you know? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I have kind of basic knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. So here's the nuts and bolts. To injection mold, you have to, to, to have a mold that um, doesn't usually, that needs to have more hits than what we would use. So the the benefit is you can do more discs at once you can have like four of them be made mm -hmm. at once four discs boom right. um now again you're not using vinyl so you're using a different kind of plastic which is good bad or the other i don't know i don't know what the plastic is noise <laughs> right it could be noisier that's exactly right um you might not have as many choices when it comes to colors and all that because not going to be as many compounders making that sure. type of plastic secondarily the big thing to me though is our stampers, the reason compression molding, which is what we do and everybody else does, um, you know, they last about a thousand hits, that stamper gets broken, it gets recycled, gets turned into more nickel, which then mm -hmm. gets made into more plates, okay? Right. Um, a mold, you have to have it where it needs to last for more hits, so oh, yeah. you can't really service a 500 unit artist. It needs to be 10,000 units, it needs to be 20, 40. Um, so it only applies to this many artists, right? Yes. So right. it's not like a guy can call up and go, hey, I want, a thousand is just not yeah. going to happen in that machine. Yep. So that's that's really where it lives. Yeah. It can live for some really big artists that think sustainability is really important, and they can spend way more money probably since there's not as many in the world, and the plastic's probably way more expensive. I'm guessing mm -hmm. in all these ways. Um, so I would I would then guess that the the final disc is going to be two three times what an already expensive vinyl record is because it's a PLA record or whatever it is. So we've nicknamed this project Adele. 
Yeah, yeah. One artist. <laughs> yeah, one Taylor artist. Swift, yeah. Yeah, take the plants out of commission for a while. Yeah, right. And then sell them for $3 at Target later. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I've, I've worked with uh, injection molded stuff relative to automotive sure. in manufacturing before. Yep. And there just seems to be some disconnects in the process and the outcome to me. Yep. I'll be very surprised if it's cost effective for one. Yep. Uh, it's like a lot of things. It could be cool to do, but you know, is it really going to stand the test of the market uh, and all those kind of things? So, and then there's the, the, um, I say green friendly approach is being taken in, in so many ways as well with some of the materials. Uh, I've noticed, matter of fact, uh, Joe played a record for us of, of yours. It was a live uh, record. Yeah. And man, I'll tell you, that record was so quiet. Hmm. It was unbelievable. It was great sounding too. It was a live uh, record, but I mean, it was so quiet and flat. You know, and I thought, man, that, that that I don't hear records that quiet that often unless they're in the more in the audiophile world. You know, right. The, the better you know material, super vinyls or clarity vinyls or whatever they are. So, right. so you guys are uh, doing a good. Say, it sounds like you're doing a good job. It literally sounds like <laughs> you're doing a good job. Thank you. Yeah, it really is. So, um, I'll be definitely looking for you know more of your products and what you guys are doing. Uh, how many artists right now have you? Do you think just in rough numbers have you processed uh, through your organization? Wow. Or yeah. Uh, so, we did because we're almost the end of December. Almost 900 projects, titles this year. Oh. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, and that doubled what we did last year. We actually made the same amount of discs, but we doubled the amount of titles we made because of the way the demand changed. So sure. we, that was been a, a blessing that we were able to kind of go back and say, Hey, we let's go everybody. And kind of yeah. more came in. It's just smaller volume on each run. Right. Sure. Um, cause yeah, cause last year was yeah 450 the year before it was like 300 something. And every year prior to that was in the twos. Great. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of titles. That's super. Is there uh, obviously the the machines you have out there? The first two you got were the first two, right? Right, exactly. Um, and and the next, the other two are the same basic configuration model as as the first two. Yeah. So uh, they make them modular. So okay. the first two came in, and really the press manufacturer was out of uh, uh, Toronto, Canada. Mm -hmm. They were really learning alongside us. So we. We basically know as much as about the presses at that point as they did, right? Gotcha, gotcha, and we were learning how to make records. They built them here on site. Exactly yeah. right. Um, but but they were modular, so when they would make updates to a trimming arm or some kind of pneumatic or whatever, um, we would get that new part, new part, new part, new part. So when the new ones came in, I would say the biggest difference in the ones that landed in September, October of last year versus the ones that were landed in, in January of 2017 mm -hmm. is really just in the uh, sound of them. If you mm -hmm. stand by the older ones, they're louder. Okay. And they walk by the other ones, they're a little less loud. Okay. But pretty yeah. much everything else the same. The computer monitors in a different space. The yeah. hydraulics are uh, a different manufacturer made the hydraulics on the older presses versus the newer. And then everything else is mm -hmm. pretty much the same. And the values that work with one versus the other it's not really a time thing. Every machine is has a personality. That's right. And so we named them as people, wait, right? Willie, you know, Waylon, yeah. Chris, Johnny. Yep. Uh, for a reason, because they really have different personalities. And you can't just plug them in and hit go. So all our operators are trained for a minimum of 12 months, kind of like, a, a, you know, the plumbers and electricians, how they work behind somebody mm -hmm. until they're able to kind of have a machine on their own. And then they have to learn the nuance of each machine. So, mm -hmm. and that gets us to quiet discs, flat discs sound good even if they're live um, because our operators are just you know they're highly trained they they're taking care of business and that's yeah that's really what it comes you talk about the human element that's a it's the whole thing it's like a chef because you have the raw materials that go into it exactly you right. have the time the temperature the the tweaking so to speak or yep. the little individualistic things you need to do yep. to give you the outcome and it's very much like that. And and I think that even though it's automated in certain ways, it still has those characteristics. Yeah, you very nailed much. it. Yeah, yeah I mean, it. very much so. So, yeah, and it's, you know, the, the people, I want to end talking about the people because the people you have here, it seems like they're involved in music in some way or have a passion about that. Talk about your the people side of your business. Absolutely. So, 
the, the, the people that we um, hired over time, they all come exactly right from the artist world, from the musician world. So graphic designers, novelists, most of them musicians, even active musicians in current bands. A lot of them do projects with one another currently. They record one another. Um, yeah, and it, and it just really matters. Uh, we, yeah. we didn't hire uh, a plastics manufacturer specialist from a different industry to come in and gotcha. figure out how to make a record. It was like, uh, I mean, our, our lead, I'll use an example, our lead technician um, who runs the entire uh, team is our lead mechanical manager as well. When he came to us, he had no no knowledge of, of vinyl at all, except for he liked vinyl. Mm -hmm. He was sweeping the floor, looking at records for a couple of years, um, didn't know what the term lefty-loosey, righty-tighty meant. And now, <laughs> if anything goes wrong, he is in the machine, up on scaffolds, taking parts of things apart, dealing with all the nitty gritty, and it all comes from his passion for music. Sure. And he's a, a drummer in a band, a singer in a band that tours around. Um, so if you, yeah, I always, I always think that about musicians, we're kind of problem solvers are in nature. That's how I started this whole thing, you know. Sure. We play a live show and you're playing at some crappy bar that they're like, here, put you behind the pool tables and the dart boards, right? And you gotta <laughs> somehow make it cool enough that anybody wants to stand there and listen to you for an hour and a half. And uh, so when you learn how to solve those problems, you go, everything else seems a little bit easier. And yeah. if you take that into business or into problems like what can happen in manufacturing, you just kind of see it from a different point of view. And so yeah. that's how we love the, the folks that work here. Yeah, no, that's great. When I uh, uh, when I talked to Joe about that issue of what's the thing that you know really is the you know holds things together, what is the thing that is most important in your business? Of course, that really ends up making the difference, and uh, and it shows you know in the product and in the processes that you guys have. So, I wish you all the best, and thanks for your time today. Great to meet you. Hey, thanks, sir. Much success to you. Hey. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us today, and we'll talk next time on the Safe and Sound Texas Audio Excursion. Take care, everybody.